Hey folks, um, so just had a, a great, lovely discussion today with a friend of mine, Rod. Um, he and I talk in this video about regenerative leadership. Um, a few other folks joined us in this call. So my partner, Sam, uh, was on the call as well. Um, he's mentioned uh, as well as Brianna. Um, so you might hear a few of those names kind of peppered throughout our talk. Those who those those that's who those folks are. Um, other people on the call. Uh, this conversation about regenerative leadership is really, really just a discussion and conversation. We do at the end get into a few of the principles that we see. We discuss eight principles uh, in terms of what we see as regenerative leadership um, within organizations. Uh, so it's a discussion. Um, we ask a lot of questions and we don't always have the answers to those questions. That's really the purpose of this, um, about an hour that we spend together talking about regenerative leadership. We're having this discussion because we see regenerative leadership as an emergent practice. Um, and why we need to talk about it more and ask lots of questions is because it's something that is emerging. Um, both Rod and I feel it. Uh, we've talked to lots of other people that have the sense that uh, there is this emergent way of leading uh, that is more in line with not more in line with natural systems. That's essentially what we're talking about through this call, uh, and and I did want to make the disclaimer that a lot of what we get into, into is a bit philosophical and not always practical. We do have a few practical pieces, but because we're asking the question about what regenerative leadership looks like and leading from regenerative principles. We don't always necessarily have a specific ways or strategies that are regenerative within organizations. So if this conversation interests you and you have thoughts and ideas, we would really love to hear from you about it. Um, in terms of uh, Rod and I having this discussion, I've known Rod for over a decade, um, and he and I often talk about connections between the natural world and how we live in society and how we do organizational systems. Uh, originally met when he was an instructor at uh, the university I did my undergrad at and uh, he sponsored a few of uh, uh, classmates of mine to establish an environmental responsibility group in that uh, in that time so we always kept in touch and uh, these conversations are, are frequent when we uh, meet with each other and hang out um, and wanted to take it online because there are more and more people thinking like this um, I also wanted to mention we, we, we say permaculture a few times and we never really explained deeply what permaculture is about. So my partner Sam and I have recently done a permaculture course through Verge Permaculture. I highly, highly recommend their online PDC and they have an in-person PDC per permaculture design course um, that I believe is starting shortly uh, or may have already started. Uh, they're great people to follow, Verge Permaculture. And essentially permaculture, um, in my quick Coles notes of it, is essentially working with nature or seeing yourself as part of the natural system. Um, and rather than segregating, for example, in terms of how we do with uh, traditional agriculture, we're really integrating things and looking for more of a natural system, how things would work in the wild if humans hadn't intervened. So we're leveraging the fact that nature works in a certain way um, in order to produce a yield that we want as human beings. So it's really partnering with nature rather than trying to control nature. And uh, quick Google will, review, will reveal the ethics of permaculture and the principles of permaculture. Um, but we do chat a bit about those ethics and, uh, and principles within our, within our chat. But I wanted to explain what permaculture was. Um, another disclaimer just is that there is a little bit of noise. Um, Rod is joining us from the YYC Growers Warehouse. And so YYC Growers is a local organization, a cooperative of farmers that sells produce directly to consumers here in Calgary. Um, and the warehouse wasn't too noisy that day, but there were a few uh, times when, when the noise uh, kind of hyped up a little bit. So you might notice that, but it's, it's not a big deal throughout the call. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention is that at the beginning, we just do a quick centering practice. And this is really a way 
to just get present and to be within our bodies. We talk a little bit, because um, it's a keen interest of mine, uh, the connection between nature and systems as well as our body. Um, so yeah, I won't talk too much more about that, but uh, it's mentioned somewhat throughout, uh, throughout our call. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's at the beginning um, and it's just a few minutes long, but you can always skip that if you want. Um, and I wanted to mention a few follow-up options. So um, my organization is Invoke Coaching and what we're really focusing on right now with, um, with my work is, is essentially about partnering with natural systems and learning from natural systems in order to help build resilience in individuals and organizations. Um, so resilience is super, super key right now in our world. And, uh, and I'm confident now having dove really deep into permaculture that the, the natural world has a lot to teach us about resilience if we're willing to listen. So that's my work, and uh, if this call interests you, if regenerative leadership interests you, I just invite you to reach out for a coffee. I'd love to talk to folks about this. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're setting up in the, the new year, 2021, is to launch a regenerative leadership academy to really bring people together that are thinking in this way. Um, so lots of options in terms of following up and keeping in touch. Here's our chat about regenerative leadership. Enjoy. If you're sitting down, just feel feel your. I mean, my invitation is to engage with with this with your eyes open. But if you prefer to close your eyes, or if you want to just kind of look to the side so you're not looking at the screen, um, whatever makes you feel comfortable. If you're uh, sitting, which looks like you are, just kind of have your feet firmly planted on the ground and feel the the uh, sit bones kind of planted in your chair and imagine that that your feet the bottoms of your feet have roots growing underneath them that tether you to the ground and make you feel really kind of firmly planted in this place i notice that i start to sway and so i invite you to imagine for a moment that you are like a tree because you have these these roots planted in the ground and imagine that you're a tree kind of swaying in the wind feeling yourself being moved back and forth side to side front and back and just sense what it feels like to be planted here and also moving either internally or externally. Notice in your body what is moving, what's flowing, what feels like it's standing still or stuck, what energy is circulating. And then bring your attention to your breath moving in and out. Notice the rhythm that your breath is creating. And with this, the rhythm of your breath, um, I invite you to ask your breath this question. What is your rhythm inviting me into? What is the rhythm of your breath inviting you into? And just notice what comes up. Maybe not an answer to that question. Yeah, and then uh, kind of come back to this space connected to each other. Um, so thanks for letting me do that. Totally on the spot. Um, yeah. Good to be present. So yeah. we're talking about what were you going to say, Ross? Oh, just uh, the the breath always invites me to ground. Always, always. 
and so and trees are pretty uh, it's a pretty dynamic metaphor for me they've, mm. they've been good friends and good anchors for me uh in the last little while so appreciate mm. the parallels you were drawing oh good maybe that was from you then because <laughs> i didn't know where the trees came from it must have been from you <laughs> So we're, uh, we're wanting to chat about regenerative leadership. And I feel like the last time we talked, Rod, we went through regenerative, resilient, anti-fragile. We were like throwing around a lot of these words and terminology. And we kept coming back to, yeah, no, we've got to call this regenerative. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't always resonate or like people often ask questions like, what does that even mean? And I'm curious, um, what are you left with as the, like the definition or the grounding of what regenerative is? Yeah, well, so I speak um, as a regenerative farmer. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I love the idea of putting regenerative along with leadership because it, it's a pretty, I mean, and I'm, I'm gonna apologize now for the, uh, the earth growing soil kind of metaphors that are just gonna flow out of my lips um but i was going to say it's a very fertile <laughs> metaphor um and so as a as a as a farmer i like when i think about regenerative i think that the entire ecosystem is going to benefit from my from my stewardship of not just seeds um and soil amendments but the my my stewardship of that that soil as well and so mm for there to be this net benefit i think um for all aspects of the ecosystem uh, even when i come in and take my my product uh, my radish or whatever it happens to mm -hmm. be so i'm extracting that out of the ecosystem um mm -hmm. but extraction is not the the end game uh extraction is the overflow of of that health of the ecosystem and so everything that I do is about feeding the soil. It's about feeding mm -hmm. that ecosystem. And then that ecosystem really knows what it needs to do to produce. Uh, these, those mm -hmm. seeds have every, everything that they need. Um, they have all the genetic material to kind of explode into their own personal life. Um, as long as I... <laughs> Damn. We're already here. Jeez. Uh, but as long as I partner with... Uh, that natural system, uh, then that, that sense of flourishing just can't mm. help but arise. Mm. So then when I think about leadership, um, uh, it just makes me feel like we're in, a, we're in kindergarten on this, on this front. Um, as humans, I think we love to extract um, and we, we love to extract even s skills and gifts and abilities from people. Uh, and it, it does build the team, um, um, but, but what is, what's that way of, of constantly giving back to the system mm -hmm. so that, that a flourishing is, is just the way that it is. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where I come, come at it. Yeah. You, you said flourishing a lot. And, and I also noticed for me, it sounds like it's mutually, mutually beneficial. Yes. Yeah. So it's not just serving you like to, to extract this resource. I eat this radish because I want this radish, it's also, it's mutually beneficial and it's relational with the soil, with the ecosystem. Um, and I'm curious, what, what was it that made you emotional about, about that description? I, I think because with the soil, um, and I, I think this happens every time we talk about the soil, like I'm, I'm, I think I'm just thrown back by its grace and kindness. Um, and that once we, once we can see and participate in that, um, I don't know, it, 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 it paints the picture of the world that I want to live in and that I want to see um, thrive. Yeah. And because it's this, it's this interconnected. Uh, you, you use the word relationship, and like that, like 
the more that I've dug into the soil, like that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It is a relationship. It's this, it's this pulsating relationship. And, and so when, when, you know, when roots go down, yes, <laughs> we need to put those roots down because when we, when we put those roots that just are even in our mind, we put those roots into a texture of interconnected relationship. And it, it makes us feel like we've come home. I think um, mm. it, it is our home. It, it's, you know, like, I don't want to get too, well, I'm going to get whatever I'm going to get right here, but like <laughs> human, human and humus uh, both come uh, from the same, the same word. Um, and humble is, is also in that same word family. And so mm. we come from this place of soil. I mean, even mm. the, the Hebrew creation story, Adam is the man, but Adama is the earth. And so like all of these parallels that we are part of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and therefore my thriving is only going to come when the ecosystem is also thriving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, what uh, words that you said that stood out were this grace and kindness. Was that a grace and kindness of the soil? That's still kind of ringing in my ears. What What do you mean by that? You're just going for the jugular here. Um, when you put a seed in the soil, it's one small micro dot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and right now um, we are in the season of harvest and that seed has turned into canola or barley in the more conventional senses or in your backyard it's turned into this beautiful kind of jungle um, and that was one little one little seed and then and then I guess the, the the real grace like you've tended yours and it is this beautiful fertile space and so of course it's it's got this beauty um, thanks Sam um, and mm. uh, but if you look like I'm, I'm part of this land of dreams project and it's really dry right now. Um, but there's been, you know, there's a bunch of different weeds. And again, like those have this absolute abundance that has come. We, we call them weeds because we don't necessarily know their gifts. Uh, we've, we've lost sight of the gift that they want to bring to the world. Um, but they're full, um, like sow thistle or prickly lettuce depends where you are, what you want to call it just was like so full this season um, and right now it's full of kind of little feathery seed particles which I'm like thanks uh, we're gonna get a whole lot more of that next year um, but this is what the this is what the, the ground does and, and we, we maybe miss it because we're like oh no that's a that's a weed let's spray the shit out of that and uh, um, but it actually is you know if we make a tincture it actually calms us down it gets a is something to calm us down. And, and what if Mother, Mother Nature was saying, actually, what all those beautiful humans need this season is some calming down. So if they were to make a tincture right. with sow thistle, um, yeah. Yeah. they would be so set for, for the yeah. fall and winter that you know there's a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. that has been happening for the last six months. Um, and I don't know, I, I like to mm -hmm. think that, that the ecosystem is partnering with us and we need to partner with her and that's, yeah. Again, she she just does it so well. So that's why I call it grace. Um, and 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 I guess the other part of it is like you can be a conventional farmer for years and years and years, spraying like just destroying the ecosystem below your feet. Uh, and the moment you decide to shift paths, um, <laughs> she just rushes to you with a sense mm -hmm. of vitality and diversity mm -hmm. and, and production. Yeah, maybe it's not all what you want exactly. It's not clean and tidy. But, but she is there and is like responding in such yeah. full hearted, full throated joy. And uh, uh, I'm, I, yeah. <laughs> I fear I'm getting off, off track here. No, it's beautiful because I, I think that really, that really resonates with me. I mean, I feel goosebumps when you say that, talk about she's, she's rushing towards you. Um, yeah, because I think that was one of the biggest things for me with learning per permaculture this year is mm -hmm. really seeing how our industrialized ecosystem has created a lot of 
um, has segregated diversity, has pulled things apart, and the invitation to permaculture, to mixing things up, to partnering with nature, to actually not partnering with nature, it's actually re recognizing that we are a part of nature. It's, it's like dropping this lens that pretends that we're the ones that get to control and extract what we want. Um, and I feel that like, it, and Sam has been doing a lot of the, the work with tending to the garden um, this year, but I've, I've felt that that rushing towards, even though I'm not always the one that's out there, you know, <laughs> pollinating things by hand and um, spending a lot of time and playing music for the garden like Sam is, I still feel this sense of she's rushing towards us and this really, this em the embrace of nature. Um, and in a way that was actually making me feel kind of sad about letting go of summer. Like, oh, I can't believe summer is going to end because then it's like I actually have to be on a break with <laughs> nature or something. Like, why are we doing long distance for a while? What, what's <laughs> happening with my relationship with the garden now that it's that uh, um, now that summer is over? Um, anyway, but uh, this this idea of uh, looking at the the connection of nature in the industrial ecosystem versus a permaculture or connected ecosystem uh, was really resonant for me. And I saw how that plays out in other areas. Like what you're talking about when you talk about uh, working with the earth is, is not just applicable to working with the earth. It's absolutely how we do life in organizations and how we do life in family systems or in society. It's so parallel. Um, so when you, when you talk about this, she's rushing towards us, it gives me goosebumps and it makes me feel all the feels because it's not just about my relationship with the garden. It's also about, oh, how is this an invitation to do life differently? Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the I, I I love having this conversation with you, Nick, because because I do I get kind of into my like the Earth realm only, and mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's easy to kind of lose that connection to the fact that that this is this is this is the way of life, um, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, like I'm, I'm spending time with the fact that that the natural world actually vibrates at a frequency, and and so then when we go out into nature, we go hiking, backpacking, living in the boonies, <laughs> maybe Brian, Brianna, um, um, we, we connect with we connect with that kind of unadulterated frequency um, that you can pull up with like scientific meters. Um, and when we go out there, we feel a sense of wholeness. We feel that, that sense of coming back to ourselves. Um, you know, last, you know, Lost Child in the Woods, you know, talks about, you know, nature deficit disorder. Um, and so, so yeah, I love, I love the way that you are kind of maybe catapulting me more towards the, the human side of this. Um, and so it, it's, it, it's, curious then because i mean i'm part of uh why was growers organization and so we've been trying to adopt mm -hmm. some ways that we work as humans together that that actually reflect this uh, vibration spaciousness mm -hmm. um this kindness this respect um and, and but also this this kind of leaning into diversity like uh it's not it's not a like um it's not a top-down kind of thing, uh, but it's 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 uh, it's recognizing that each diverse human has a beautiful contribution to make, and so then, but then, how do we how do we organize ourselves in a way that allows mm -hmm. that that contribution to yeah. flourish? Yeah, 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 yeah. And when, as soon as you said this, each diverse human has a contribution to make. I thought immediately about the weeds and the classification within the structure of our society of this is 
this is something we want to produce and extract, and these are the things we don't want to produce and extract. So let's control and regulate and turn down the volume on these things and turn up the volume on this, which to a certain extent makes sense. Like as we intervene as humans within the ecosystem, it makes sense that we'd want to maybe get certain things out of it. I think that's part of our relationship with the system. But I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts about what I just said? <laughs> um, well, I mean, immediately it brings up, um, and I don't think we talked about this <laughs> in our little pre-conversation next, so. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it brings up my, my favorite book from 2019, which is called The Patterning, Patterning mm -hmm. Instinct uh, by Jeremy Lint. And uh, he, he really talks about, you know, like very much, you know, we as humans, um, one of the things that we do to survive is we categorize. And our entire education system is, is built on us creating categories because it helps us organize and understand and learn. And so we, we have this need as human beings to, to kind of create a structure. Um, uh, the, prob the problem is that, that that can then dominate, the structure dominates, um, and then all of this division uh, is 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 just the dominating piece of our world, and so you know, listening to you say, yeah, you know, so there's words and or weeds, and they they you know offer us a gift which we've already talked about, but you know, most people listening to this are like, come on, <laughs> let's 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 get real, um, gentlemen. Uh, but but I think you're I think you're absolutely right, and and so from our Western mind, this, this is what this book really kind of hit home to me. From our Western mind, we want to we want to see things as good or bad, and so we immediately we something comes in and we 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 judge it. And so before it's even had an opportunity to speak uh, or to 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 try and say I have a gift for you, we've already judged good bad. Uh, if it's good, then we, then we'll maybe kind of take a listen. But if it's if we've determined that it's bad, we're not going to listen. Um, and so that actually, as a farmer, if, if I'm doing that, if I'm not actually paying attention to the weeds uh, in, my, in my gardening system, I'm missing a lot of good information because the weeds come um, as a function. They're actually there to try and solve a problem. So a lot of times, yeah. you know, tillage in industrial um, systems is, is one of the ways we cr create a nice tilth so that we can put seeds in it. But what we've learned is that tillage actually destroys the, the fungal component of the soil. Um, and so it ends up being heavy on bacteria. Well, what, what thrives in a bacterial rich ecosystem? Weeds. What, weeds, what we call weeds. <laughs> and so, so they're telling us very important information. We know, mm -hmm. and so if we wanna grow vegetables, which is what we want, that's the good stuff. Um, but our practices are producing bad results, which are the weeds. Um, if we don't pay attention, like if we just nuke the weeds, we're adding another bad solution onto, uh, I mean, actually I'm getting uncomfortable using this good bad because I've been really trying to take it out of my life, <laughs> take, take that <laughs> notion out of, out of my vernacular. Um, but it, I think you, you see what I'm saying is like we, the weeds come and then we, we apply this other destructive thing to try and deal with that rather than listen to the weeds, pay attention, observe, observe, observe. And then go, okay, well, what's going on? Okay, well, now we know weeds thrive in bacterial rich. I want zucchini squash. And that absolutely requires a fungal kind of network under the soil. So if I want fungus to grow, that's a, that is a, a thread-like network under the, under the soil. Um, every time I till, I'm like a barbarian just ripping that ecosystem to shreds. So my actions are actually not getting me the result that I want. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting about what you're saying is I feel like it's, uh, it's seeing these specific situations that come up as solo events and not as interconnected. Yeah, bro. So really, to me, it's like systems. I love systems thinking because it's about shifting our lens to seeing things as interconnected. And then in a, in, in a situation where you, you're thinking from a systems perspective, if you see weeds, the question is, 
So what's happening in the system to create this versus I see this incident of the weeds and I don't want them because they're perceived as bad. And so I get rid of them. And then next year I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious um, how you would like speak to that from your, from your standpoint as, you know, a leadership coach and uh, from working in different organizations with, yeah. with humans. Like, do you have a parallel? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I think about uh, I, uh, for weeds specifically, or for systems thinking. Yeah, both. Uh, so what comes to mind right away is not necessarily like nonprofit organization specific, but I guess what could be seen and what, what we chatted about last time, I think what could be seen as an, as an issue in organization or a weed is turnover, for example. That's like, a, it's a poor indicator. Um, and so there might be ways that an organization tries to address turnover, uh, like um, doing a survey or asking people, you know, what would, what would, or asking people when they exit the organization, what's making them choose that, uh, which is still, to me, it's a very, uh, it's still a very surface level thing. You're not looking at the whole system as interconnected. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. I mean, the idea of turnover, um, conflict. I think conflict is another one. Conflict could be looked at as uh, something that you need to fix versus something that could be generative or regenerative. You know, maybe the conflict is actually something that the system is trying to do in order to like unearth something or to make productive use of of something. Um, and when we do, so specifically uh, systems team relationship coaching, uh, when we're doing that, the question is always about what is the system trying to do? Uh, the question that we ask the team when we're doing that type of coaching is what is the system trying to do here? So we're trying to get people to think that way, not, not me as the coach saying, oh, this is what the system is doing, but it's really about everyone within the system tapping into the intelligence that's there in the room. Um, so, I mean, those are two things that I think, you know, conflict, turnover, or organizational things that could come up um, that I think would benefit from a systems lens. But when I think of a systems lens, there's, uh, I think of it as, as this holistic way where you're actually inviting the system to be reflective and to understand what's going on within itself versus sometimes how people use systems thinking. It to me still feels like industrialized influence is where you go in, you analyze the situation and then you as the external expert say, this is what the system's doing and this is what you need to do to fix it or that I don't think is a holistic approach and one of the reasons I don't do that type of systems coaching. Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind for me. What comes, what comes up for you in terms of, you know, like even YYC growers right now, what do you see as organizational weeds? Yeah, I mean, hmm, that's a good, uh, good question. Um, I mean, I think number one, there was um, this siloed reality. Um, and so people have their job and, they, and you've got a lot of work to do. Um, but it was hard to know really what the system was doing and so so what we needed to, was some kind of a platform in which to to kind of understand what the system was doing and so so uh yeah i think just in like march we adopted a tactical meeting approach and uh and so that um yeah and i think every other organization that i've been a part in you know worked a lot in the nonprofit world myself um before doing the farming stuff but um, I think every every other organization, like it, that sense of siloed reality, is is a very real thing, um, and and that yeah. feels like an echo of 
to me, silos feels like an echo of, I mean, the word <laughs> is absolutely an echo of industrial farming. Right. And the, the idea that the approach is, it's a parallel process to how we do industrial food growth. It blows my mind actually, how much, how we organize as a society is paralleled to how we produce our food. Mm. Um, and that, that idea of being siloed or growing in rows versus being diverse and interconnected in an organization, I think that's, I feel like regenerative leadership is the invitation to move from one to the other. Uh, I love that. And, and, and I it feel will thrive. Like, and sorry to say that again? It will thrive. Yes. Yeah. It. Yeah. We. Yeah. Well, and I feel like then it, I mean, so then the real tension is like then moving from, from this awareness into, 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 into the pragmatics. I think one of the things yeah. that yeah. took me <laughs> out of nonprofit work was the fact that, you know, farming is very, Tangi tangible, very tactile, um, and you see what you do, uh, and life is produced. Um, whereas in the nonprofit, you're like, it's a big question mark over your head all the time. Mm. Am I doing anything here? Um, but then, but then I'm like, on these tactical meetings, I'm like, we, we've, we've had these incredible. Like, I mean, like, is this really my work colleagues? You know, having this kind of heart-oriented check-ins and check-outs um, at every meeting. Um, so we have this human moment where you come with your full humanity into the, into the meeting. Then we do our meeting, which is very precise and very um, ordered. Um, and then we talk about you know, what we need from team members. And then we do this other human checkout. Um, and for me, it's just been such an inspirational Thing to be a part of because I think everything in me has wanted a structure that elevated um, the human experience mm -hmm. in our work. Um, yeah. 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 So we, you've mentioned a few times this, the approach to a uh, shared leadership approach that you're using at YYC Growers. Um, and this is often what we connect around is non-hierarchy is that i don't know if that's the right way to put it for me it's the right way to put it um not that hierarchy is bad so this this is this is my newest um letting go of uh, i'm letting go of the idea that hierarchy is bad i think i used to think that way even when i was in it even when i was a person that was in uh, the hierarchy um i actually felt that it was bad but i i just I think that it's not resilient. It's not regenerative. It's not anti-fragile to only have hierarchy as the way that we approach organizational dynamics and society too. It's like we have this one structure that we will model everything after. And if we have one way of doing things across our society and across our organization, that's bad, bad for all of us. It's not it's very fragile. Yeah. Um, so to me, this is where this is where I've come to is that to have as much diversity in how we approach um, structures, organizing ourselves, uh, and I think that goes for family systems just as much as it goes for organizational or societal systems. Um, and so you've mentioned a way that like YYC Growers is using this, these tactical meetings and some approaches that I know are taken from holacracy, so a specific approach. Um, holacracy is a specific approach to sharing leadership. And I'm curious, what, what have you seen as you've shifted um, in YYC growers towards more shared leadership approaches, towards more holacracy? What have you seen or noticed in the system itself? Yeah, beautiful question, beautiful words, Nick. Um, what, yeah, I think, I mean, the, the very first thing is um, my role as a general manager um, 
you know, the buck stopped here. Um, and so I was very ineffective in doing much of anything um, other than putting out fires because I had a lot of things mm -hmm. on my plate that I was trying to accomplish. Uh, and as soon as we brought in kind of the, the holacracy, uh, a real clear description of roles and people have domains that they own um, and and we back that up with with a decision making process and so as long as they follow the decision making process um, they are free to make those decisions ah. <laughs> liberation for someone who has where this the buck stops with you like um, and there's there's still that sense that they need to consult the people you know seek advice you know from me uh, oftentimes you know as things got going now I, now I feel like I need to seek advice from you because you guys are the are the pros in the in this domain and that has been that's been an astounding shift in in our mm. organization um, and I think it it uh, well I, yeah just this one young student he's back at school so he's shifted roles but he's pretty much kind of seen a lot of what we do and has been in charge of a lot of what we do and to to see him thrive in this place of responsibility, um, we kind of exhausted him a little bit. Uh, he was happy to because he was a student, but uh, feel, still feel a little bit bad about it. Um, but uh, yeah, like uh, today is his first day where he's not in the warehouse. And I texted him, I'm like, what is this? Is, this isn't even a real day because Logan's not here. Like <laughs> we're, we're in this new space. Um, but I can, I can, I don't know if you can hear a little bit of the warehouse background noise here, but uh, mm -hmm. we've got two new employees and they're, they now are taking on that domain. Uh, they're a little nervous, um, you know, because they're, they're kind of on their own today. Just another one of our colleagues had a massive migraine and had to mm -hmm. sit today out. Um, but that, so I'm sitting here doing this call. I feel quite comfortable that, you know, they're going to, crush it even though they're nervous um and so that's a huge shift whereas i would ha i'd have this hyper sense of responsibility that this entire organization is going to collapse if i'm not like gutting it out in every mm. aspect in every corner um and so i feel like i have a much better life because of of some of these these uh, practices that we've we've adopted yeah yeah, it's, I mean, I can really feel that from you because there was almost like an exhale, like a ah, like a relief of when we moved into holacracy, this allowed for the not all of the weight to be on me, which yeah. is definitely a dynamic I see within organizations. I mean, in my and my frame of reference is really nonprofit organizations, uh, where usually the senior leaders feel the most amount of like they feel well not the most amount that's not fair to say they feel this heavy weight of organizational responsibility and other leaders within the organization or frontline staff feel not empowered to make decisions for themselves and it's just to me it's just like oh okay well like but these things add up like there's a <laughs> there seems like a simple solution like you're overwhelmed you're unengaged like can we not like kind of share yeah <laughs> it feels like an invitation yeah for sure that. yeah no it's it uh, i mean and i just want to comment too like i know you've dug into a little bit on the holacracy thing and mm. and i would i would call what we're doing a bit of a modified holacracy yeah um okay. but uh and largely because holacracy, I think, is, is just, it's a lot of rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so my understanding of what, like, when I, I've looked into holacracy a bit, attending your, um, your meeting as well, it gave me a good view. Um, but also the workshops, is, yeah, it's like really structured approach, which is, you know, in some cases, is really good. If you're struggling with, you want to move towards a more collaborative leadership approach, but you're really reliant on an existing structure, then it seems to be a gateway. Like it's one, it's one option. And in terms of diversity, I would say like holacracy is one option. There are so many other unexplored options and I think options that will emerge for sharing leadership as we move forward. Um, and I think it's great, 
like the idea of adapting, taking some components of holacracy and adapting it for your particular system shows some resiliency, some regenerativeness. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, and I think, I mean, I think the, the other gift of, of what I see, I mean, it's a little bit of our, I mean, you talked about turnover and because we're a food oriented organization, it's a lot of, not a lot of margin. Uh, and so our wages are not, you know, totally there. Um, and so we do see a lot of turnover, but what I've seen with the, the holacracy or just even our shared leadership approach, um, distributed leadership is what we call it here, um, is, that, is that people are engaged. Like, engagement is not our issue at all in, in the organization. And, uh, and I think that, I think that does, that, that is one of the, the, one of the gifts of, you know, focusing on a regenerative approach to, to leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, one thing we talked about last time we connected was the tension between wanting to create something as a leader and then the idea of what's going to emerge within the system. So I'm, I'm really interested in this because I don't have an answer to this question. As, as per most things in this conversation, that's why it's a conversation kind of workshop. Um, but uh, the idea of, okay, I want, I want to make something happen in the world. I want to move something forward. I'm motivated. I have a passion that I'm taking a stand for something. I mean, that is typically, I think, what we think about when we think about leadership. And I don't think that's bad. But I think it's in tension with the idea of what is emerging in this system. What's happening? Is there resonance with what I want to do and the needs in the world? Um, yeah, so what do you think, <laughs> I don't know if I can leave it with you first, uh, put you on the spot, but what do you think we need to pay attention to in that tension or in that balance? This is, um, this is a very electric topic for me, even just today. Um, <laughs> And you're right. I, I'm, I'm a dreamer, and I've always been a dreamer. And I want to see, I want to see a different world manifest itself. And uh, I've gone down different leadership paths and different circles, and and often find myself articulating to well, probably articulating in a strident way to a unappreciative audience mm. uh, and so all of that does not add up all of that kind of goes in a more of a negative direction um, and so i think um for me as someone who carries a dream um <laughs> and is very nervous and suspicious of power and hierarchy and privilege and things happening too easy. Um, I've often kind of downplayed that dream. Um, and I feel like the gift of that in, in my life right now is actually what is coming into this, this idea of emergence and the fact that that is, that is the way that I resonate. Uh, I've been a nurturer my entire life um, and, you know, took care of the plants when I was a kid. Every time my grandma would go, I, she would have me come over and take care of her house plants. And she had an epic amount of house plants. Um, sometimes I feel like the spirit of my gram grandma Olson is running through my veins most days. Um, um, so having a dream and not kind of being an obnoxious able um, <laughs> in, the, in the process. Um, and I think what, and, and yet, and yet that seems like there's so much of our culture that is like drawn to that 
as a way of leadership, as a way of inspir inspiring our community in it. You know, and so I live my life going, okay, I just need to be a little bit more like that. Uh, and this morning I had this incredible moment of integration that um, I just, I can't even believe it. Um, because I've, I've, I've anchored, I've wanted to go outside myself to find these anchored, anchoring moments of uh, brilliance, of, of insight, um, and they've all, they've all kind of happened as these encounters. Um, <laughs> one is like hugging a tree and the tree's like, Shh, you know, Rod, just calm down, root down, root down. You know, like even, even encounters like that where I feel like the trees are talking to me. Um, there is this externalized kind of reality to it. Um, and I think if I'm to pay attention as a, as a leader in a, who wants to see something emerge, I think it's, I think it's already happening. It's already happened. Um, I think, you know, when I look at the screen and I see you, Nick, um, there is a desire deep inside you that's already emitting into the ecosystem. Uh, there's already the answers and the solutions that are on their way to, to kind of meet that deep desire. And I see Brianna, the same thing. Like there's, you're emitting this, e this frequency um, and we can measure that too. Um, and that frequency is, is, is returning to you, to us. Um, and I guess the way that another way to, for me to say that is that I've I've lived my life quite a bit around this notion of you know am I good enough am I doing the right thing am I doing a good thing am I good um, you know lots of layers of deep shame and worthlessness and so of course I get myself involved in nonprofit work because it it, it actually makes me feel good um, and this morning this moment of integration like that question am I good enough just melted away as I had this <laughs> experience of going of oneness with myself um, and that how dare you ask that question you exist therefore you are good therefore you are here to resonate and emit an energy force and an energy field that is rooted and connected to the ecosystem and so everything you do like what you want, wants you. And this idea that I, I want a beautiful um, picture where humanity in all of our diversity and all of our difference and all of our spiritualities and dogmas uh, come together and make space for each other. I mean, dogma is a little dif difficult to do that with that one, but that's what I want to see because that that picture of, of, us, of us as humanity is what's going on below our feet. And, mm -hmm. and so I feel like I'm not really answering your question, Nick. Um, yeah, there's dogma, a lot in there. <laughs> but but there's, there's an emergent, and I guess that's it. Like, mm -hmm. I finally this morning, and I'm saying it here in front of you without having maybe taken on the, the necessary time to really reflect on this. Um, but there's been this, this integration where I need to just simply say yes to the dream, say yes to the desire, say yes that, you know, to me not necessarily fitting into this hierarchical way that we're doing things. And that's fine. Like, stop trying who you are, what you are attending to. And, and that's why I feel like, Nick, what you're doing with regenerative leadership is so, so, so vital in, this, in, this in our time right now. And I think part of that regenerative movement is us <laughs> really anchoring in and going, no, we're not wrong. There is a, there's a, there's a new way trying to be born. And there's, there's sensitive folks like you all in this call that are so attuned and already ready for it. So let's just, let's yeah, get it done. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel really affirmed now in a way that I didn't because of permaculture that this is, oh yes, this is regenerative, a regenerative approach 
leaning into resilience and diversity and creating anti-fragile anti-fragility in our uh, society and in our organizational systems and in our family systems this is absolutely going to happen um and i like i feel sure of it because of permaculture um yeah. which it feels like a different orientation than previously where i was like fuck this 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 system sucks right. i was like it's just shitty and i don't necessarily feel like that now it maybe it was there for a reason uh, it shows up in nature and, you know, I can appreciate it in a different way. And I don't feel like I'm standing against it anymore. Like I'm against hierarchy. I'm just for also other ways forward, which feels like a really good shift for me. And, and for me, it feels regenerative that I'm, I want to create um, and lead in a way that isn't about not doing this it's just about yes. opening up more possibilities it's just about an invitation um and the other thing that i don't know how this fits in but let's see if it does as i as i extrovert this thinking um the other piece is about the the idea of and it's related to what i just said it's the the rest and digest system the parasympathetic <laughs> system so our our nervous system has more than two branches, but these two main branches are often talked about. And one is the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS, <clears throat> you know, triggers the fight and flight. It's the stress system. It kind of makes things happen. Whereas the PNS, parasympathetic nervous system, is our rest and digest system. I think it helps us to reflect and to seek renewal. Um, and I feel like there's actually this embodiment thing that I now am doing when I'm, when, when my neck isn't forward and, and I'm in the future, hoping that things will be different, trying to make things happen. This is my embodied way of doing that. I stick my neck yeah. out. I le lean and live into the future. Um, whereas when I'm actually, when my neck is aligned, when I am in this embodiment, I feel this immediately, like even in this call, in this moment, I feel an immediate shift when I move through that different embodiment where I'm actually accessing my, I think I'm accessing, I don't know, I don't have an MRI or anything going on, but I think I'm accessing my parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, right. which is actually the PNS is, is when you're taking a stand for something that's a positive emotional attractor. And so that is, an engagement of the parasympathetic nervous system you're actually creating a, a positive like when you you resonate more with people whereas the sns often because you're you know fight or flight like get out of this make something happen you're creating a negative emotional attractor so not to say there isn't a place for creating negative emotional attractors i think there is um but i think my my orientation to accessing more of my parasympathetic nervous system helps me to live in the moment and to know, okay, actually there, this thing is gonna happen. This emergence is gonna happen. And it gives me a sense of ease in it versus stress about it. That was like a lot of words. I don't know if that made sense, but that's what's happening for me in that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think I think you're bang on in it. And, I think in this regenerative leadership and on route to resilience, there is such a need for us to get out of our head, which I think is the, that's, that's the industrial um, model is that we think we can think our way, strategize our way out of the, the situations. And, and so, you know, having a breathing practice or a meditation practice mm -hmm. or a grounding practice, um, I think becomes so so key in this in this in this journey yeah 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 yeah, yeah for sure yeah living into the body Cause, uh, and i think there to me there's this parallel between accessing more of the my body wisdom as well as accessing the wisdom of nature it feels like those journeys are deepening at the same time i'm like oh right yeah like my body and my brain, like every, this is also a part of nature. Um, but it's something that we don't often bring, we don't bring nature and we don't bring the body to the workplace very much. We're really reliant 
it feels like on, as you said, our heads, solving problems more cognitively. Um, yeah, so that feels like another invitation for us. How do we actually bring the body and, and therefore more of our ecosystem into workplaces? Yeah, brilliant. This call has more questions than answers. Right. That should and have I been think, a disclaimer, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and I loved what you just said there because it, I mean, if we think back to the, to the gardening world, um, a plant is this, is this living technology that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, sends it down its leaves into its root system and exchanges that carbon, di di carbon dioxide into sugars for the microbial life and then emits an oxygen. So it's like this beautiful technology that's exactly what we need for this time in our, in our life. And I just had this picture of, of us as humans um, in our, like with, a, with an activated PNS, parents and blah, blah, blah. Um, we are, like you said, we're more open. We, we, like that's where that compassion and kindness is going to, to thrive. Like we as human beings are also these little, technology is required uh, for this time in, in our history as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I just got yeah. super excited about that notion mm -hmm. that, yeah, like let's practice being these sonar emitters of energy fields that are on the hunt for other regenerator, regenerative leaders um, mm -hmm. that are trying to do this good work. Um, yeah, yeah. Because we need each other right now. It's out there. And, and that's, you know, when you say that again, I, I, so I come back to soil. Um, so as a, as a metaphor, I think that the connection between people that are, that are in this emergence uh, or resonating with the, what's emerging or what we're being invited to step into more of, more regenerative approaches, more, more resilient ways of being together, um, that these people are out there more and more. And the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, oh my gosh. And people resonate with it. And, and, and so that's, it's really exciting. And to me, that feels a bit like the soil or the soil health or, mm. um, or the mycelial network, the connection, the interconnection underneath the soil that's going to create the space for this. Um, yeah, so for me, just this, the idea of talking about it and resonating and connecting around it, even if it's still somewhat, you know, as I said, then are there practical tools that you can take away from this conversation today? I don't know. Um, but we need to have more conversations like this in order to get there, I think. Agreed. Um, so I wanted to go, because there, we had these like core core principles for regenerative leadership that we like completely skipped over because we went deep really fast. And so I just want to say what they are and Rod, you can fill in any blanks that, that, um, that I've left here. So I think in order to, to be leading regeneratively or to be creating regenerative organizations, as Rod and I talked about this in preparation, we came up with eight things. One is that this, these organizations, these people are life affirming, uh, diverse, and, and perhaps w along with that, interconnected. These organizations and leaders understand seasons and cycles. Mm. It's not just all about production. There's also the PNS, there's the parasympathetic nervous system, there's rest and digest, which is undervalued in our society. That's four, life-affirming, diverse, interconnected, seasonal, and cycle. The fifth is the idea of self-regulation, observation, and feedback-oriented. So not just, I think that's the systems awareness piece that we're talking about, not just making the thing happen, but also open to the idea of seeing what the system is trying to create, um, observing that, taking in that feedback, and self-regulating. The sixth is understanding that things are always changing and shifting within the ecosystem. Things aren't static. Things are always growing. There's new relationships. There's a new piece coming up. Uh, the seventh is um, 
is balancing all ecosystem needs. So this is the, uh, in permaculture, this would be the ethical piece of, um, the, the ethics of permaculture is future oriented, people oriented and planet oriented. So um, balancing all of the ecosystems needs. So that would be another one of regenerative leadership or leading in organizations. And then the eighth one, and this, there could be more, there could be less, like we could be wrong also, but this is what we thought. Um, waste is an unused resource. Um, we're actually, Sam and I have talked a lot about this <laughs> recently, uh, just noticing within our house uh, of, of things that we waste, things that we throw out, um, that waste is actually a resource for the organization or for the uh, society or for the family system. We're creating waste, but it's actually an unused resource, so reorienting towards that. These are the principles that we thought yeah, you know, maybe if we can leave you with anything, uh, will be to to stew on some of these principles, and then maybe you can tell us what you know what the answers are. Um, but these feel like really key important principles to lead regeneratively or to have a regenerative organization lean into that. Anything you'd add, Rob? Oh, you're still muted. Um, no, I, I, I really quite, quite like that. Um, the seasons and cycles, I think is such an important yeah. one. Um, we're so death phobic, uh, in our society that we, we miss, um, when things need to kind of be, we need to let go of things. Um, yeah. And then that, that the notion of the dynamic reality of organizations of living systems and, uh, yeah, the, the fact that we need, we need, what was the, the observation one? Yeah, so we need number five in order to deal with number six. Um, mm -hmm, we need, we need right. observation. In order, like taking in feedback, observing, in yeah. order to understand that things are always changing and shift, shifting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I, I agree with the list. And again, there, yeah. there might be more, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> And I love this seasonal and cycles one. That's really, really important for me right now, I think, as we move from summer to, to fall. And one thing I heard recently, I had a, um, a massage, my massage therapist was talking about her apple tree. She said, she, her understanding is that this apple tree she has doesn't produce every seven years. Is this a thing, Rod? It every seven years, it takes a break. Have you ever heard of this? I've not really heard of this, but I've heard that, I mean, there's like Saskatoon's this year did not really produce um, Saskatoon bushes. So I know that there's, there's something going on. Um, I just thought it was the tree knowing that it didn't have, but I've seen a lot of apple trees this year that are, are loaded with apples. So it's not a, it's not a year specific, but yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I just, whether it's true, I don't know if it's true. So I did want to confirm, but that, but the idea, the metaphor of things needing to take a break, things needing to recharge and rest. And I mean, that even plays out on a, on an annual basis where we live through our seasonal cycles, but even on a daily basis, I don't often think about it, that there's, you know, we rest every evening. And so how can, how can that play into how we lead in organizations? How can we create time where we're not producing, where we're resting and recharging and reflecting. And that that actually is going to create more health mm. for the organization. And actually, it will produce more. <laughs> you know, we're focused on production. And so we're like, produce, produce, produce. But rest is actually an integral part of production in an ecosystem. And so therefore, why wouldn't it be within our organization? Because we're also an ecosystem. So maybe that's also practical. Do we do some practical things? <laughs> yeah, two practical things. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording, but we can hang out a little bit longer because we still have a few minutes. Um, thanks, Rod, for making the time today and for always having inspiring conversations with me. I You're love it. <laughs> welcome. Thanks.
Thanks for having